Hi, Quincy. Hello. Can you hear me? Hello, everybody joining us. It is Tuesday. This means there's another welcome webinar for you. We have a special today. We're going to give a minute while the room fills up. Thank you for joining us. Whether you're watching this via Zoom or Facebook, thank you so much for being here for another session of welcome webinars. I'd love to know where everybody's joining us from. If you use a chat room, please let us know where you're joining us from. I am in Portland and Quincy is in LA. And today we're gonna to talk about one of my favorite subjects, creating monsters with one of my favorite monster makers, Quincy Vadan. He's an LA based artist, but he's really from all over. Uh, he's going to tell a little bit about your, his story in a little bit. And he's going to talk about his ideation process and creation process um, to create creatures using ZBrush. Excuse me. Well, my PowerPoint is not working today. All right. I'm your host, Elizabeth Garcia. Please use the Q&A uh, uh, feature on Zoom to ask your questions that I will filter to Quincy. And if you're joining us via Facebook, we have a moderator there sharing their questions, your questions with me here. I will be asking questions throughout the webinar, but we'll also save some at the end of the webinar. And if you miss this webinar or have to leave, we'll be sharing this recording on YouTube later on. For those of you watching in North America, we do have a couple of codes for you to take advantage of some specials to receive $50 off Welcome One. Please take a look. Thank you, BNH, for always supporting us. And like I said, today we're joined by a very special guest, our friend. Quincy Vadan. Quincy, how are you today? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm excellent. I'm excited to talk about monsters today with you. Um, one of my favorite programs, ZBrush. I've been hosting a lot of ZBrush webinars lately, so I'm really excited to see you using it. And um, please take it away. Thank you for joining us, everybody. You can share your screen now, Quincy. Okay, okay. cool. Let me, let me do my screen share. All right, can you see my screen? Uh, no. You can't? Oh, let me push the, see. There it is. Okay, so now you can see it. I can see it, we can see it. Thank you, Quincy, and we see you as well on the side. Okay, cool. So, did you want me to just start battling? Yes, please tell us a little bit about yourself and what you will talk about today. Um, so my name is Quincy Vaden. Um, I'm an LA based designer. Um, I primarily create monsters, creatures, characters in ZBrush. Um, my story is not a very typical story because I don't have a background in art per se. So I went to art school and Academy of Art. Well, let me, let me rewind. My original profession is actually an F-16 jet mechanic. So after high school in 95, when I graduated, I went directly to the Air Force and I took a test called the ASVAB, which let me know that I had a really high aptitude for mechanical. So I became an F-16 jet mechanic at the biggest fighter squadron in the world. Um, did that for four years, got out, went to art school, went to Academy of Art University in San Francisco. I actually studied fine art illustration while I was there. Um, and I stayed more in the fine arts department because I wanted to know more about design composition. And so I started out traditionally, so it was mostly pen and ink, watercolor, oils. I then took some fashion classes while I was there as well. Um, I think about two semesters before I was to graduate, I dropped out 
And I decided that I didn't want to be an illustrator anymore. I didn't like the way that illustration scaled as far as like sales. You can only do an illustration once. And if somebody doesn't like it, you have to go back and do it all over again. So I'm thinking about the actual economy of, of my artwork. Like what medium has the most economy? And I thought to myself, well, 3D has the most economy because you can reuse assets, you can pose things, you can change things, you can change colors, you can change forms very quickly without having to actually redo the project. So I kind of just cold turkeyed off of illustration and self-taught myself ZBrush. And um, I've just been taking online classes for years, um, learning by myself. I actually have a big notebook. This is the notebook that I use I've been using this notebook for six years. So I, you know, I'll watch a tutorial, I'll catalog the steps. I even created kind of like my own curriculum so that I could, and my own map legend with a series of symbols, almost like a analog written code that I can use so that I can associate memory with certain symbols. And that's how I learned it because I knew that I wasn't gonna be smart enough to remember all of these steps. So I had to create a system for myself in order to learn it. So um my so I, I studied zbrush for you know i've been doing it probably for like five or six years and i've never actually worked in the art industry full time i've um i've done a couple of contracts here and there but i mostly sustain myself outside of the art industry by doing styling and art direction and i've uh, been doing consulting on jewelry jewelry design helping other people launch products just using my fine arts degree and just my, my sense of uh, design. So everything I do in 3D is simply because I want to do it. It's just because this is what I want to do. I, you know, I don't make any money off of it, but I get a lot of self-satisfaction from it. So, um, so this is the result of me just being a, a hobbyist and just, and just sticking to it and just really wanting to create these things. And um, that's kind of my art background, just so you can kind of understand why, where I come from. You know. Thank you, Quincy. So very self-taught, non-traditional path to, to the art world. Mm. Yeah, yeah, very much so. I didn't, um, like I haven't taken one in-person 3D class ever. You know, I've never had anyone, like I, don't get me wrong, I had friends that I will hit up online and say, hey man, how do you do this thing? But there's only so much information that can really be shared online. You know, I don't have the like the collegial work environment where I can just say, hey, excuse me, guy or girl, you know, how did you do that thing? Like, I, I don't really have any of that. So, you know, I'm just here in my room, you know, kind of doing my thing daily, like till three o'clock in the morning every day. And, and I enjoy it. But yeah, not traditional um, whatsoever, like not even a little bit. So it's but it's it's more fun this way, I believe. Well, I, I can't say it's more fun because I haven't done it the other way and I'm not shading the other way of, of, of following a track. But for me, I enjoy it because I've been able to not be, I don't have any overseers. I don't have anyone imposing time limits upon me. I don't have anyone imposing subject matter or technique or flow or what programs I should and should not use. So, you know, I'm in essence a, a, a kid at, at, with the Play-Doh Fun Factory. Like I'm just out here squeezing and pinching and pulling and coloring monsters. And I, I even approach my sculpting in more of a primitive way. Uh, I said primitive because I don't use a lot of the, the techniques and assets that major studios or people who are connected to those major studios have. I'm still using it kind of like, kind of like Play-Doh when you, you know, you would sculpt little men with Play-Doh with, with your hands. So I, I like it. I mean, I feel very satisfied with it and it's, I, I truly enjoy it. So, yeah. So you talked to us a little bit about your background, how you started. You've been learning ZBrush for, for years now by yourself. Mm -hmm. um, how long did it take you to, to feel comfortable enough in ZBrush to start creating monsters in ZBrush? Um, I th so when I first started, um, like I said, I was, I was annotating it in that, in that notebook. So with me having a mechanical background, I thought to myself, so when I went through technical school for fixing jets, you went through like, mm, I think it was like 10 or 12 weeks of training before you even touched a real jet, like an operational jet. And we had these books called technical orders and a technical order tells you what all parts do and you know, how the modules connect. 
So I look at this, at this program like a machine. So I can't just grab a tool and start tinkering with the machine and you're gonna break something. You first have to learn what all the parts do. So I probably took about six months and I took a class, I think at that time, it was by Ryan King's line, it was called ZBrush Workshops. Um, and he had an intro, to, he had a ZBrush class and just talked about what the buttons do. So for six months, I just sat down and annotated what the buttons do. So like, what is this, what does the brush pull down menu have? What, what are all those tabs in that pull down menu? Just what do they actually do? And then on the side, I would write notes about how I may be able to apply that particular action to a future project. So I didn't even create anything, I think, for about nine months to a year. But when I did create something, it was, it was a lot better than I expected it would be because of my understanding, because of my like mechanical approach to the, uh, to the, uh, to the program. But I mean, if I did, it, it's not that hard. It won't take that long for anyone. I mean, they have stripped down versions of it, like ZBrush Core, ZBrush Core Mini. Um, they even have like, you know, uh, 3D modeling iPad app. So you can jump in and the tools are, are streamlined for people now. So it wouldn't take anybody else that long. That's just how long it took me. Thank you, Quincy. So tell us a little bit about what we're looking at. Uh, are these your, your reference or your, your mood boards? Yeah, so this is, um, this is something I've been compiling for a while. And this is kind of a, a mosaic of all the things. Because when I thought I was going to do this webinar, I just wanted people to kind of understand that, you know, there's a common thread that runs through all of our artistic experiences. There's this thing or this genre or this one movie. Some, for some people, it's just one movie. It's a toy line. And there's this one thing that really fuels who we are as artists. So mine are um, 80s war movies, man. So this is just a mosaic of all my favorites. These are the things that when I was a kid, I was watching, you know, in my grandma's basement at like one o'clock in the morning. I had no business doing it, but it was really cool. Uh, Hellraiser, Ghostbusters. I mean, you guys may or may not, depending on your age group, I'm kind of dating myself right now because I remember these old ass movies. But um, Twilight Zone, Hellraiser, Beetlejuice, Blob, you know, I mean, you guys probably, I know you recognize this. I'm sure you guys recognize, you know, some of this stuff. Labyrinth and, you know, David Bowie with his two tight pants and Big Trouble, Little China, Evil Dead, you know. So this is just kind of where my mind is at. And I just kind of wanted to show that to people because I think it's really important to you know, not really resist where you come from inspirationally. You know, if you're just like a Gundam lady, you know, and you just like Gundams, just do that, you know? So that's kind of, I just kind of wanted to show that, you know, for that reason. But, Excellent, yeah. I see, I see you have Bowie there. Uh, yes. Some beauty among all the monsters. Yes, oh, Goblin King to me was, I mean, David Bowie is so beautiful and, and, and evil looking at the same time. He, to me, he's like in the league of, of, of this Fright Night guy. I mean, as far as being an icon, I mean, everybody knows that's the Goblin King. Like, to me, he's one of the best, one of the best characters I've made. Beautiful man. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously a big David Bowie fan. I like David Bowie. So. I like the Predator a lot. Oh, to me, Predator is one of the best creatures ever made. It's my favorite sculptor of all time. His name is Steve Wayne, worked on this Predator. He also did Underworld 2, Blade 2. Like that, this is th this exact picture, he did the Predator, that's exactly the lane that I like to kind of, to be in. It's one of my favorite things probably ever. Is Predator. Quincy, which monster um, terrified you the most as a child? What monster, what? What monster terrified you the most as a child? As a child, man. I'm trying to think most, well, this movie Sleepaway Camp was pretty freaky. It was a really, really scary villain reveal. That one was terrifying. You know, surprisingly, what was terrifying to me also was the movie Christine about the guy, he had a possessed car. Oh, is that a, a Stephen King story? Yes, oh my, I don't know why that movie freaked me out. Cause I would watch like a, like I would watch Hellraiser 
And you know, the, the Uncle Frank scene with no skin and the do what is your pleasure, so all the crickets on his face, like that didn't bother me at all. Jason didn't freak me out. This worm person, whatever this worm dude is from uh, Poltergeist 2, I watched this stuff and it was no problem. Also, this dude from Twilight Zone, the movie, I don't know if you guys have seen it, but the movie, this is also a, a creature from the movie, a gremlin on the, on, on the plane. But this creature here at the end freaked me out so bad. It was one of the few, and I remember it's the reveal at the end of the movie, and the guy asked the other guy, he says, do you want to, I'm not going to give you the scenario, but this monster reveals himself out of the darkness, and it's a really big surprise. And I remember I was in Kansas in my grandmother's basement by myself. I think it was like 1985. I think I was like eight years old. And, and like, I come from a family of working women, so they were always gone. So I, I kind of had the run of the house by myself. And uh, I remember I had this big ass TV with all the cable channels. So I got to watch all these movies. And I remember watching that and the monster reveal happening where this guy, you know, comes out of the shadow, freaking me out. And I was alone. And then I was like alone in the basement. And oh my God, I was, I was traumatized. But then I was also kind of intrigued by it. And, and, I, and then I would say, oh, I'm never watching that again. I was too scary. And then the next day I'd be on Cinemax watching the same movie all over again. I don't know. I don't know what's wrong with me. Something's wrong, obviously. Well, if it's wrong with you, it's wrong with all of us, because I'm seeing here in the chat that we have a lot of horror lovers. Somebody's uh, asking if you're a Fangoria Magazine subscriber. No, but I used to, um, I, my mom, so my, my mom wouldn't buy me the magazines. I could watch all the movies, though. So I would go to the um, grocery store, because that's what they were sold back in the day, and I would just flip through them. So I would go to the magazine, you know, the magazine section, and I would flip through all the Fangoria magazines and then I'd have to put them back. She wouldn't buy the magazines. She, I could watch the movies, I could buy all the toys, I could buy the comic books, but I think Fangoria was, you know, cause it's like Kansas, it was really Christian. So I think, you know, buying your, you know, nine year old son, something like a, you know, I don't know, some dude with, you know, a gash up his face, you know, you know that says the evil did too. I don't, she just wasn't, she wasn't about that life. So no, but yes, I was a fan, definitely. Quincy, tell me a little bit about when you started drawing monsters. Uh, did you do a lot of fan art or did you start creating your own monsters right away? Did you, did you learn from the masters or did you just go rogue immediately? Um, you mean like at earlier in life or, or later in, in my career? Early when you, were, when you were learning to draw and developing your technique, did you, did you automatically start drawing your own characters or did you do a lot of fan art to get better? Um, I think the very first thing I ever drew was my own version of Godzilla. I remember watching Godzilla when I was, I mean, I was young, I was probably like six or seven. And I remember watching Godzilla and I remember thinking, man, I want to draw my own version of Godzilla. And I went and I was bugging my auntie and I said, hey, can I borrow some paper? I want to draw this, you know, this comic book. And she was like, dude, there's a whole stack of typing paper over there take as much as you want. And she just kind of said that to, you know, like deflective to get me out of her face. But I mean, the, the typing paper stack, it was like 10 reams of stack of typing paper. You know, she was like, you can have as much as you want. I don't care. And I was like, wow. So I took them and I, and I made my own comic book and I stapled it together and I drew all these panels of, of my version of Godzilla. And I remember I was taking water out of the faucet and, and putting it on the ink to make it like some kind of a, a crude watercolor wash with my fingers and finger painting with it. So I always, um, from the very, very beginning, I've always wanted to just make my, my own original characters because I, I, I just want to see what, what I would like to see. I love watching other people's characters. It's, it's great because people make stuff that I can't even imagine, but I have always wanted to personally make my own things. And that's kind of been my story, kind of, I think, my, my whole life. I don't think I've ever, uh, I, don't, I don't even know in my life, maybe, you know, when I was like 10 and somebody was like, draw me Hulk Hogan, bro. You know, and I drew Hulk Hogan or something, but I don't think I've ever finished a complete fan art image on my own ever in life, I don't think. Not complete, ever. Well, thank you, Quincy. Go on and show us some of your monsters. Cool, cool. I'll show you guys what I'm working on. All right, is everybody seeing that okay? We sure are. Cool, so. Let me um, let me reveal all the sub tools.
And again, uh, for everybody wondering, Quincy is using ZBrush and he's working on a Cintiq Pro 32. Yes, yep, this is ZBrush and I'm working on my 32, which is, I love this machine. It's huge, but I have a really, really big table and I don't care. This thing is awesome, I have so much. You guys already know what it is. I don't have to do like a commercial, but I do love this machine, it's, it's awesome. But um, yeah, so this is a, um, a creature I've been working on in ZBrush obviously for probably, Mm, I've probably been working on this off and on probably for about a month. Um, I don't really have a timetable because I just do this for myself and I do it only because I want to. So I really take time and take care to really work on the areas that I want to. So I'm, I'm not really concerned with time, but yeah, it's been about a month and I probably got about another two, three weeks to go before it's fully finished and textured and stuff. So um this creature is, I'll go ahead and tell you a little bit about this creature. So this one is, how can I say it? So I guess I'll just, I'll kind of describe his physiology. So these barbs here are poisonous. Both of these barbs, all of his fingertips, even his teeth, if you look and see there, are these humongous sacs here, and I'm thinking of these sacs as poison, you know, like poisonous sacs um, that feed you know, these glands here feed these fangs. Same with the neck fangs, poisonous glands here that, that feed down with this vein leading down into the, um, the hypodermic fang. So <clears throat> I was really influenced obviously by um, snake mouths and the fact that snakes have hypodermic fangs, which to me is, I mean, it's just terrifying. I mean, just getting bit by an animal alone is, nuts, but the fact that it can bite you and then inject something into your body at the same time, it's just, I don't know, it's just beyond freaky. Um, so yeah, I've been working on this dude for, for quite some time. The, um, the legs are still in Dynamesh. I'm still working on those. I'm still trying to, you know, work more of a cat foot out here. So I'm going to have to truncate this and I got some better reference. Like I actually got some reference from a bald sphinx cat to, a. Uh, to go ahead and, and you know finish that up but for the intense purposes of this demo i'll be doing some i'll be focusing more on this area so but um yeah so this is all again in the eye glands i just thought it would also i think it's also really strange when you have a creature that's excuse me that's obviously a predator but it has no eyes you know it just has these kind of sensory organ things like it used to have eyes and then it kind of started to evolve to not need the eyes but somehow they stay there and they're just loose underneath the skin hanging and they're they don't actually you know calculate sight or anything but maybe they sense vibrations or you know maybe i i don't know but that's kind of what i was thinking here and to me that's really scary to look at a monster and to not truly understand its physiology other than it means to harm you. So I, I kind of added this element to give it a little bit of confusion and, you know, add an element of, of you know, kind of wonder to it instead of it just being so outwardly visceral, you know, so. Quincy, when you start designing your monsters, um, do a lot of these ideas come at you at, as you go or did you set out to do a monster with snake fangs and that kind of body from the get-go? Or do you just start sculpting and this is what you sort of free-formed? Um, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll make a, I'll come up with some kind of an idea, you know, and I'll go to my sketchbook and I'll do a bunch of scribbly sketches, right? Just rhythm lines. And then when I come up with an idea, I have a, so let me see, uh, I have a set library of references that I've been compiling probably for about four or five years. So when Pinterest first got hot, you know, I, well, Pinterest is still hot because I, I love Pinterest. I use it all the time, actually. Um, and I actually am, if you guys want to share that whenever you want to, I sent links to my monster reference page on Pinterest, which is another um, resource that I use and I've been compiling that page for years like for a very long time so what I do is I take references and I will compile them categorically so you know I have a folder for monster skin I have a folder for each and every individual artist that 
that really speaks to the kind of art that I like to do. And I have all of that compiled in, in folders, but categorized well, so that when I think, like when I was talking about this, this leg and I found a cat leg reference, that cat leg reference is in a subfolder called Creature Skin. And it's a, it's a, a series of, of just that, just examples of great creature skin. Um, and sometimes I will do subcategories within that. But one of them is the Sphinx cat because it's such a great wrinkle reference and skin reference and also anatomical. And the thing about Sphinx cats that are really cool is you can see the bones and muscles underneath the skin. So everything is categorized so that when I come up with an idea, I can then go directly to the reference and it's deliberate instead of, you know, like, pushing around mud on ZBrush and then breaking it up and then go to Google search and then do some more and then do another Google search. I have most of my references already picked and most, all, I mean, it's a lot. Don't get me wrong. It's not like 10, you know, it's probably like, I probably have a couple of thousand, but I know exactly where they are. I know exactly what folder they're in and I know exactly by the label, what kind of effect those references in that folder are going to have for me. So idea, reference gathering, then I make a reference page on PureRef, which is the app that I showed you with the mosaic, and then straighten the sculpting. So it's kind of streamlined for me now, so it doesn't take very long. You said that the tool you use to see the references on ZBrush is called PureRef. Oh no, so that's a standalone program. It's called PureRef, and what it is is it's a program that allows you to compile images on, on a um, on, on a on a document and then resize them and move them. So can pure you ref references mm -hmm. brush? What was that? Can, can you view those references on ZBrush? Like right now, could 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 you have that reference on the right, let's say? So you could um you were, but in pure I'll show you I'll show you the difference so that people here can know because I think this is this is really important that you're bring this up because it's a great it's actually a really great tool. So like this is pure ref independently. So the, thing, the cool thing about this, this is that you can move this stuff. So this is a standalone app. So I have two screens. So I have my, my Cintiq and then I have my secondary screen. So on my secondary screen, I will have this document open. And so the thing that's cool is no matter what you drop in, the res still remains. Like see how close in I can go to this dude. But then you see how big the document is. Like it's a very, very, very big document. So I was actually, you know, I was one of those dudes that was very resistant to this idea because sometimes, let's, get, let's just be honest, we get lazy and we don't want to learn new apps. This is not an app you have to learn. Um, and what I would do is I would have, you know, like 10 preview windows open. I would have to jump back and forth. And then this one is just so much easier. Pumpkin head, the fly. This one is so much easier and all of these are movable. So that's what PureRef does. So I will then compile my references on a pure ref board and now i compiled this particular board for this um for this webinar but now this will be one of my permanent references because this is exactly the kind of so imagine these things in folders in subfolders so this is exactly what i do so when i am probably you know devoid of ideas i'll just pull this up scroll around you know get some ideas and then you know go back into my main repository of, of images so that's, so that's pure ref. Thank you for showing us, Quincy. Mm -hmm, no problem. And then, uh, yeah, so I mean, would you like me to go ahead and maybe start playing around with this thing or? Yeah, please show us how you do some texturing and you know, what you're gonna continue to do with this monster. Cool. So um, this is not really going to be a, it's not really going to be a how to use ZBrush kind of thing. I'm just going to kind of talk to you about, you know, what my thought process was while I was creating these forms and, and some of my, you know, my uh, inspirations, influences. Um, so I don't mind technical questions. That's totally cool. But there are people who do just a better job than I do. You know, like I said, I'm a kind of a, I'm kind of a ZBrush primitive guy. So, you know, the, the really deep, deep nuance program features are something that I don't use very often, which I'm still learning too, but feel free to ask me those kind of questions. But I would really love if people would ask me 
substantive, like off the beaten path questions, like questions that you would maybe want to know, but wouldn't want to ask in front of an audience at GDC or something. You know what I mean? Because it may be a little too, uh, I don't know, intimate or too thoughtful or something like that. But any kind of question is good. But I, I you know, I, I prefer, you know, actual substantive questions. So, but feel free to ask anything you like. Thank you. I'm going to go to the Q&A while you, while you work. Cool. Uh, we do have a few questions, but the Q&A is open. Please send Quincy your questions. He does know ZBrush really well. This is not a tutorial on ZBrush, but if, you, if you're seeing something on screen and you're curious about what he's using or what tool he's doing, let me know and I'll ask him. Uh, Tania Hernandez wants to know, in your opinion, Quincy, what do you think is the most important element for a successful creature design? Um, I think the I think the ability to research and the ability to I think you have to know what, a little bit about physiology, like actually a lot. So if you I see what happens with a lot of creature designers is they'll be designing a creature and they'll want to shock the audience, which is cool, which is kind of the point. But without knowing what the physiology of something is, like there'll be a, a guy and he'll put you know, he'll make a creature, but instead of the eyes up here, he'll put like two extra eyes right here on the forehead, but like there's no brow ridge on the eyes, there's no eye bags, there's no structure, it's just like two eyes right here. And, and you know, they're just like, man, this is crazy, he's got four eyes. And yeah, you can actually make that work. There's a character called Trigon in DC who has four eyes and it looks good because they understand the anatomy of the skull. So if you want to do things that are, you know, designs that are kind of out there, I think the best thing to do is like, so for instance, on my, on my desk all the time, I have this equoche, this dog, like it's, it's always there. You know, I have a dog, I have a deer, and this is not set up for the webinar. This is, this is all the time. I always have, you know, different forms of anatomy in front of me all the time. So like, just like this creature, I wanted to do a creature, but I wanted him to have a, a dog or a cat leg. So what I got right here, I got my dog leg. So I think the best thing a creature designer can do is to really study physiology and really study anatomy so that when you do want to add a tentacle or, you know, a, a extra hand or an extra arm, you can do it correctly. And I think that, I think that's probably the best thing that a, a character designer can do. Quincy, did you ever have doubts about whether your work was unique enough from others to catch the proper attention? Christopher Coleman is asking us. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we all have, we all have those doubts where we're like, man, is my stuff good enough? Is it, is it original enough? And yes, I do very much less now, I think. But starting out, yes, of course. And I think it's natural. And I think it's good that you judge yourself. I just think that you don't need to overjudge yourself. I think it's really good to compare yourself to your peers, but do it, do it in a way that's a little bit more removed so that it doesn't really affect your self-esteem. You know, you can look at things technically and you might say, hey, well, did that person technically perform those operations better than me? Not is their creation better than mine because there's you judging yourself, and that's one, one way. And then the market judges you. So there's so many different layers of judgment that I don't think you should fall prey to any of them because there are just too many. Because if it's not this, this system of judgment, it's that one. If it's not that one, it's your own. So I think, you know, judgment is healthy as you grow and, and to facilitate growth. But after you're starting to find your, find your way and you've got your wings, I think you kind of have to leave that judgment behind a little bit. I think it's, it's better for you in the long run. And then you can actually kind of be free and, and make what you want to make. Thank you, Quincy. From Facebook, we have a question. What video games have inspired you? Or what video game companies do you like? Are you a fan of video games? Um, so, I don't play games, but I'll watch the gameplay videos on, uh, on YouTube. 
and I'll buy the art books. My favorite game of all time is the Double May Cry series. There is just no better game. I haven't even played Double May Cry 5 yet because I'm trying to save it to where I have a, a complete month of, of like nothing. Like I don't want to talk. DMC, when that came out, the last one, I literally took like a month and, uh, and played that game and did nothing. But I don't, I've only played, I have an Xbox One over there collecting dust. I mean, they probably have spiders in it right now. But I mean, I've only played like three games on it. But the game companies I do really love, I really love Santa Monica Studios. That's really good, really good games. Um, Sucker Punch does really good. That Ghost of the Anamisha was a great looking game scenically, um, obviously character wise as well. Um, I love the Gears of War art. I love the, um, I love Dead Space. So I'm a fan of like video games as a genre. I don't necessarily want to play them because it's like, I'll play them and I'll be like, dude, I could be making it. You know, it's like, I can either create it or consume it. And I'd rather, I'd rather create it. But yes, I'm a fan of what those studios do. And I love looking at their work. And those studios are a big source of inspiration for um, the stuff I do. Santa Monica Studios is one of the ones. And then whoever did Dead Space, I'm not really sure, but I have their art books right over there. And uh, Ninja Theory, or uh, um, people that did Devil May Cry. Um, a lot of the Japanese stuff, Final Fantasy is kind of like my, to me, I mean, I've never played, I've actually never played a Final Fantasy game ever, like never. Because when this stuff came out, like I was already fixing jets, dude. Like I couldn't be at home, like, you know what I mean? Like my life was already kind of in full adult swing, so. I couldn't really, but I have all the art books. So Final Fantasy is a humongous source of inspiration for me, so. Thank you, Quincy. When you're starting from scratch, do you prefer Sculptures Pro, Dynamish, or just sub-diving sub as you gradually get to the details? Christina Halstead is asking. Um, I usually start out with just Dynamish. Dynamish using Sculptures Pro, so. Dynam and I tend to I tend to stay in Dynamish for quite some time. I know it's it's kind of a bad habit, you know, but you know, subdivision does lock you in. And I mean subdivision always yields the best results for detailing, but I probably stay in Dynamish for about probably 60 to 70% of the life of the sculpture. So like for instance, this head is I only subdivided this head once. So this head is just out of Dynamish. So people that do the do ZBrush know what that means is that I got all of this detail out of a Dynamesh. So, so I go from Dynamesh and I use Sculptures Pro and then I subdivide and I do a lot of projecting and reprojecting. So I'll, so like this head, I've subdivided it once. So I think this head is only, what is it? It's, it's like a million problems. It has two subdivision levels. So I'll do, some, I'll do more texturing on this head. And then since it's not truly detailed, I'll then reproject it again. And again and again, until I get all the forms right, or you know what I believe is, is right. And then, and only then will I, I subdivide. So it's kind of weird. I kind of do subdivision level detail in, in Dynamesh for quite some time. So it's just so I can get all of the curves and pinches and creases. And then when I reproject it, it's, easier for me to you know deal with the curves because it's still in Dynamesh so you know it's only been subdivided once so I can always just go back to Dynamesh lose no uh, lose barely any fidelity and then adjust the forms to kind of accommodate the curves I want so that's kind of my, my thing. Thank you Quincy. Mm -hmm. Has your increased understanding of human anatomy negatively affected your own self-image, body image, um, your own anatomy, et cetera? Campbell Winslow asking a very interesting question. That is, you know, that is interesting. That is an interesting question. Yeah, it is a, that's an interesting question. It is weird because you do, <clears throat> when you sculpt, you're, we are all taught to sculpt perfect anatomy, you know, or atypical anatomy. So for instance, that's a really weird question. I like it. Um, so for instance, when you think of Superman, Superman's physique, 
right? We think of him big, broad shoulders, humongous biceps, tiny, tiny pinched waist. But you know, um, Superman's physique is actually the physique of a female bodybuilder because of the, the waist to rib cage ratio. So when we're taught to sculpt, we're taught to sculpt atypically attractive you know, physiques, you know, seven heads high, three and a half heads wide. So sometimes, yeah, you do look at me like, you know, because I'll look, I'll, I'll be sculpting like, you know, this, this guy here. I mean, if you look his, and, and th this is a perfect example. Look, look at his physique. I mean, he's a monster. Look, look at how toned and perfect his arms are. And then, you know, I look in the mirror and I'm like, damn, dude, I'm like a skeleton, man. So, I mean, it's kind of, it is kind of a, it is kind of interesting because we are programmed as artists to beautify our subjects. It hasn't negatively affected me though, but that is a very, uh, I could definitely see how that happened. So in art school, in, when I went to art school in San Francisco, we, we had a class called Heads and Hands where we painted or drew just that, Heads and Hands. So then there would be class exercises where you would, you would paint your classmate and I would instantly see, you know, the, the air go out of the room for some people who don't actually want to be painted because you are now being put on a pedestal and, and you know, you're, 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 you know, everyone has ill proportions on their face. Like I have, I have an asymmetric ear, like I have a crooked nose. Everybody has that stuff, crooked lip, you know, one eye bigger than the other. But then when it's put on blast at a place that, you know, really uplifts perfect anatomy, it did get kind of, you know, it could get kind of strange. So that's an interesting question. So yeah, that's kind of, that's, yeah, it can happen. I, I wouldn't, I, I would understand if it did, but it shouldn't, we're all cute. Everybody's looking good. Thank you, Quincy. A question from Melissa. Mm -hmm. What do you do when you spend a lot of work on a monster and it's still not what you imagined. Oh my God. Yeah, I mean, I probably have about, oh my God, uh, probably like 50% of my projects just in, in kind of like failure. But what I usually do, man, is, is I will sometimes put projects down for like a year. And so what I always do is, is I have this thing where I hate not solving problems. It bothers me. Because I feel like if, if you can think it up and you can plan it, it should be successful. You know, so what I'll do is I'll, you know, I will beat my head up against it for a while. And then I'll just put it down. And I'll put it in a, in a, in a file folder to where I can come back and look at it. And I'll pick it up in a year. Like I have these vampire parasite creature things that I've been trying to really nail down, I think, for like two years, maybe even three years. And there's like five different versions. And they're all still floating around on my hard drive. And I actually looked at them about three or four days ago. And when I find the right reference or, or gain enough knowledge, because I think a lot of times when we fail, it's just that we bit off too much, you know, more than we could chew. So we really just kind of have to go back to the drawing board and just learn a little bit more. It's not that we failed or it's not that, you know, we suck or it's like, I'm not good enough to do that. No, yes, you are. You're just, your, your ambitions probably outpaced your skill. And I'm guilty of that too. I, I do very ambitious projects. So I fail often, but how can you do great things if you don't do great things? And, you know, to, to do great things, you have to practice them. So the failure is a, is a part of it. And, and you have to fail if you want to do cool stuff. I mean, you have to try and fail a lot, a lot, or you can just do what everybody else does and just completely copy the last thing you saw and then just, you know, do a little transform tool on it and change the color palette. And you can do that and be successful and, and there's no shade in that. But if you want to do really cool stuff and, and, and what you consider, what you consider um, great things, then you have, to, you have to overreach, I think, you know, and overreaching means failing. So it's a natural thing. I think so. Thank you, Quincy. Um, Victoria Galignanes wants to know what brushes do you use? Um, so uh, 
<clears throat> Let's see. So this is probably my workforce brush. It's called, it's by Pablo Munoz. Um, he does a class. He's also, I, I put together some links um, for you guys that will be shared later in the chat um, about resources of, of people who just have really great ZBrush resources. And Pablo Munoz makes brushes. He, he has a, a website called ZBrush Guides. He does a uh, class called the Extra Mile. And this dude is, he's dope. And so he has this brush called the Clay Brush Details. And it's kind of like a clay buildup, but look at this alpha. It's this kind of grainy alpha. So what it does is, I'm just gonna do a, a air stroke. See how the buildup is nice and round? It's round this way and it's round this way. So this is kind of one of my workhorse brushes. I mean, I just use this brush for everything. It kind of replaced my clay buildup. So even on my clay buildup brush, I, I still use it, but I use that alpha. And so it's square at the edge, but it, it's just a little bit softer. There's that, and then I don't know who made this brush. I'm gonna go to this, I'm gonna go to the face so that I can do a little. So this brush is called the, what's it called? Rake Fine Tool. I don't remember where I got this brush from. I think I got it from like the bowels of my hard drive or something, but somebody made this brush is dope. So what this does is, so say I have, and this also is a custom scribe that I made. So I mean, you, have the damn, you have the damn crease, which does a really nice line, but it kind of pinches. And then mine, I just kind of took the pinch out. So it's a very subtle difference, but so this is a custom brush. So let's just say I want to you know, put a little space in here just to show that there's some, some skin connecting the bone. But then I decide that I actually don't like how much that's separated and I want to kind of merge it a little bit or not merge it, but kind of smooth that over. So this rake tool is great because It just kind of, it's, it's like the same effect of having a wet paintbrush on clay. Let me do it on this subdivided mesh. You'll probably see it a little bit better. So let me find a, let me find a form. Okay, so say like, uh, like this line right here, this particular line. I don't, I don't really like this line, which I don't. So it's kind of like, I, I sculpted, like twice in art school. I'm not gonna act like I was a sculptor. I wasn't, I did, I did like one class, no, two classes in art school and like that was it. I, I, I got too dirty. I, I just really wasn't about that. Um, but one of the tools that we had was a, a wet paintbrush. And so you dip the wet paintbrush in this, you know, this water that has clay in it. It's basically like clay water and you brush it on your, on your sculpture before you put it away. And, and you can also use it to kind of blend clay forms. And so this is the brush that I use to kind of blend and that's all it is, is like that. But, you know, it just does a really good job of just blending things together, you know, like right here. If I want to kind of, I do it for like skin stretching over muscle, you know, and then kind of getting rhythm lines. And then also, um, what else do I got up in here? Um, Another Pablo brush, uh, knife tool, uh, point tool. So a lot of these are brushes that people have released to be used with, uh, to mimic traditional clay media. And I use those traditional clay media brushes in Z brushes, workhorse brushes, because it just gives my, I feel like it gives it a more naturalistic feel and it helps me get more like volumes. You know? I like volumetric sculpting and then I would also like to talk about my um, materials. So I think also another thing in ZBrush that is overlooked sometimes that people don't really talk about very much are materials. So this is a custom mat cap that I made and it is, um, it's my startup material. So it's basically kind of like a, um, it's like a basic material, but it has a little higher specular. So this one is one that I use for volumetric sculpting. So this one mimics the look of traditional clay. And if you can look at it, like the volumes, like the, the, the convexity of these shapes are really, really, really obvious with this material. 
Whereas this one, they're still, they're still obvious, but there's a lot, it's, it's all about the highlights. So this one is really good for really sharp shadows. Whereas this one is good for kind of simulating you're in your studio, you got a lump of clay on a pedestal and you're sculpting. So as you sculpt, you know, I rely a lot on textures. So one of the things you have to think about is when you're doing texturing <clears throat> and you go to paint it, are those textures, all these lines, these pock marks, these bumps, these veins or whatever that you're putting in there, are they actually complementing the form? So there is a, a gentleman by the name of, I'm going to butcher his name, forgive me, Zilong Zhu, I believe. He's a, he's a really good zebra sculptor. He specializes in doing ornate insectoid um, designs. He's, a, he's super dope. So he sold these, these um, materials on our station. So this material really lets me know what, what my cavities are. So if you notice, <clears throat> I zoom in, that all of these textures, or as many as I can manage, they are all following the forms individually. You know what I mean? So there's one thing what I see a lot of people do, and they'll do um, they'll do textures, but it'll just be they'll just be drag and drop textures, and it just makes the model look sandy, like it has a layer of kind of I don't know if that's a procedural texture that they do, or when they bring in a substance and they do procedural, but it makes the surface of the skin look grainy, and I prefer. Um, I prefer a more deliberate texture. I don't consider myself a fantastic texture artist either. Um, Cause I mean, by, you know, movie studio standards or gaming studio standards, this is probably like a pretty shoddy um, texturing job. But so this material really shows that off. And then when I'm going into um, deeper sculpting, I'll use this. This is a material by another, I got it from an artist named um, he's really good. Amokar Aldana Fong. He's an amazing artist. Um, I saw him doing his, a live stream with this material and I asked him for it. And he's kind enough to give it to me, but it actually is origin. It's authored by Bruno Kamara, who is also another, uh, another amazing artist. But this one really shows your cavity. So let's just say if you're trying to, sorry, my auto save. So let's just say if you're wanting to do these do a little bit more in cuts here. I don't know if you guys can see that, but as soon as you get a little deeper, it changes color and it just really shows off like the cavities. So it's not only brushes because brushes won't do it. They'll do a lot for you. Don't get me wrong, that ain't crazy. But the thing is, is, is brushes in conjunction with materials are kind of uh, something that's overlooked, I think, is, is the material aspect of, of sculpting. So I hope that answers your question. I was kind of wrong. But... Absolutely. Thank you for going over materials and tools. Quincy, when you start sculpting a creature, do you usually start with the head or the body first? Andrea Sanchez is wondering, and so am I. Um, always the head. I, um, if I can't see the face, I'm not even into it. I'm going to be honest. Like people say, like there's a lot of people that, you know, say um, you need to block out the whole body so you can get the proportions locked in. And I'm, you know what, I'm going to be honest with you. There is nothing exciting about a, like a headless you know, faceless mannequin. It's just, it's just dead to me, man. I don't know what it is. Now, if it's going to be a complex pose, you know, I'll do some Z spears. Like that's cool. So say I do a Z spear rig, um, and I get it posed. I get the box mesh posed out. I go immediately to the face. So for me, it's uh, it, it's like chest up. I have to do the chest up. Or I'm not even interested. It doesn't even. Like you can show me the coolest body, but if if it doesn't have a face, I'm still kind of like ah well. What is that? So for me, the face is always the, and, and I don't move on until I get the face locked in. If I don't get the face locked in, I'll, I'll, I'll literally put the whole project down and walk away and come back and not continue until I get the face locked in. 
period. Every time. And we talked a little bit about this yesterday during the rehearsal, but maybe we can touch upon it right now. Working in symmetry, I've seen some sculptors be really into it like you are, and some sculptors um, arguing that they're gonna break symmetry anyway um, at the end, so why use it throughout? What's your, what's your stance on that, working using symmetry throughout? Uh, I mean, I think there are people that are that good where they can not use symmetry, you know, and, and I think that's, I think that's really cool, but I think we all, you know, have to kind of be a little bit honest with ourselves as far as our skill level. And for me, I am not, I'm not skilled enough to not, you know, to go into a, a project with no symmetry. Like, I mean, I, I could probably do it, but it would probably quadruple my creation time. And if someone can do that and do it in a timely fashion, that's fantastic. Like, I, and I don't know how you do it. And that is straight up wizardry. But for me, I am really just trying to knock out the design. I don't really care about not, you know, about breaking symmetry. Usually I'll break symmetry at the very, very end with some light texturing and the poly paint. A lot of time the poly paint is I break symmetry, but I don't, I don't really get the idea of, of still advocating for going completely non-symmetrical. I mean, that's the whole point of this program is so that you can not do it symmetric, you know, so that you can use symmetry. I mean, that's the whole, like, that's the whole idea. So if you want to do that for a personal project or for personal enrichment, or, you know, you want to um, really showcase that you have a traditionalist technique, I think that's cool. And I, and I really like the asymmetrical sculptures. I mean, they look, they look really, really good. Um, but that's just not my goal. So I think a lot of times people give suggestions to artists and we as, as artists who are learning from these, from these various um, ladies and gentlemen, we look at them and, and we listen to what, what they say and we think that, oh, maybe they have a better way for me. And their skill level and our skill level may not be the same. So if you're that skilled and you can, enter, you can go into a sculpture asymmetrical and make a, a beautiful work of art, you know, in a timely manner, please, by all means, I, I suggest you do. And I suggest you continue to practice that and get better at it because it's something that most people don't do. But if you're just trying to get in here and design something and just like make something, why? Like, I mean, do it at the end if you want to, or, you know, do an asymmetrical costume. You know, I'm not saying that it's bad, but I don't, you know, I remember people would tell me like, dude, you should just do one, do a sculpture with no symmetry. And I'm like, yeah, with what, three months? Like, thanks. I mean, you know, thanks for the, why would I want to do something like this with no symmetry? You know, that just doesn't make any sense. If you're doing, car you know, something more, um, you know, more cartoony or, or stylized to where it has, you know, not as many details, maybe, yeah, but, you know, if you're trying to do like some dragon rider, some undead dragon rider with a lich on its back or something, I don't know, do whatever, you know, why would you want to do that asymmetrical? That's ridiculous. I mean, kill yourself if you want to. I mean, not really, but you know what I mean. You know, destroy your wrist doing that asymmetrically if you want to, but I, I got into ZBrush recognizing the amazing economy of stroke. And that means I can do the, the most with the least. And that's what I'm here in this program to do, the most with the least, so. I love that, the economy of stroke. Yeah, for sure. That's, that's the whole, to me, that's the whole thing about ZBrush is the economy of stroke, 100%. So, you know, if you wanna do that, that's great. Quincy, do you do um, 2D animation or 3D animation by any chance? Um, you know, I haven't, um, I've never done any 2D or 3D animation. Um, I think when the software, like rigging software gets a little bit more user friendly, and I mean that by saying automated, um, I think I would definitely be interested in animating these because I always have a Every creature I do, I always have, I start with like a movie scene, you know? So I don't know how many people have seen Blade 2, but there's a scene in Blade 2 where the guy Lighthammer 
kills, um, what was his name? Uh, Snowman, Donnie Yen's character. And it's like in this tunnel, there's the, the tunnel is, is, is lit from the back. And when they discover him being killed by that guy, the guy, he'd already turned into one of those reapers, you know, with the mouth, with the jaw. And, and he's, he's still biting the guy. And then as he realizes he's discovered, he looks at the camera and you can just see the, the parts kind of fold back into his mouth. So that's what I was thinking about this dude is I'm thinking about him in a scene like that and he's actually hugging a victim with his whole body and the neck fangs and the body fangs have just kind of, are just kind of cradling this person, reaching behind them kind of up into where their kidneys are and, and he's kind of you know grabbing them and pulsing and pumping venom into them. And then as he's discovered, he turns around and the, the claws release, the body claws release, and he's maybe holding it with one of his hands. And you see that there's, you know, venom dripping out of the fangs. And that's when you realize that they're actually hypodermic. So I would love to get into animating um, one day when the software is a little bit more forgiving for people who've never animated before. Because I do think with, a, I, I believe I think with an animator's mind when I make these, because I kind of have to or else they won't make sense. But Maybe one day I'll do some animating. I mean, I think, I, I think it'd be fun. I think so. Quincy, what gave you the idea for the claws or hands? Zeke Culver wants to know. Um, let, me, let me turn on the... Uh, what was the idea for the hands? I think, um, I think this is a repeated element from one of my old creatures I did. Because I, I like to iterate, you know. So I think I did a creature a long time ago and he had like a split hand where it was split between four fingers like this. And I think I just wanted to make something that looked like he could use his hands to be agile. You know, so if he needed to grab some, you know, if he needed to grab some tree branches or climb down some pipes or something, you know, he said he could actually climb into the scene, you know. So I wanted to make something that looked grappling and then had a little bit of bird, like something a little bit avian in the hands so that his hands look like they move fast, you know? So it was like a little bit of bird claw, um, a little bit of just copying, the, you know, just kind of some of the anatomy because, you know, kind of the skin folds and there's a little bit of sphinx cat in there. And I think those two, and so I'm thinking about, I haven't decided yet because I, I think I'm gonna eventually print this one. So I'm thinking about putting a bar that comes out of here so that when, when his hand is like closed, you know, it's just closed, but then when he opens it up, like a barb comes out, you know? So I'm kind of leaving a piece for a barb. And then you can kind of see the pads on the back of the hand are kind of reminiscent of the pads on, on, a, on a dog's paw, you know? so. I did look at a lot of dog feet, um, dog feet, falcon feet, um, and I have like a, like right over there, I have like a big ass. I have like a pretty large bone collection, so I always kind of go, I don't know if you guys can see these, but like I always kind of dig into these for like, it's a horse to, you know, so just different stuff. Like there's some kind of animal, but I don't really even know. But I always kind of dig into this, into this thing so that I can find a little bit of inspiration. So again, references. You see how it was like nice and tidy in a little Tupperware. I don't need to think about where's my cat foot. My cat foot is right there. I don't need to think about where's my, articul my articulated boa spine. It's right there. So I just went and go, go to my bones, go to my dog foot here. And then um, I just kind of like build the physiology in my mind, how many fingers, you know, and then I just build those fingers out and try to take those, those physiologies and just kind of melt them together, so. Quincy, Victoria wants to share with you, uh, if you're curious about animation, there's a, a tool called Advanced Skeleton for rigging. So it's not like Disney level, but it's quick and really easy to use, she says. Oh, okay. Get out advanced skeleton. Advanced skeleton? Well, I'm down. That, that would be cool. Yeah, there's a couple of, of programs like that. And they do, seem, um, they do seem actually rather interesting. So 
Yeah, I think I'm probably going to get around to them eventually. I think so, definitely. Space a little bit. So Quincy, you use real life references for anatomy, but do you also use them for the way the monster's body and system is going to work? Like with the cat paws and legs, for example. Beyond the look, does it also work? Do you also look at how body parts work for different animals and different creatures? Um, yeah, I think you have, they have to make sense because if they don't, like the audience might like it at first and then they'll kind of realize that that doesn't really make any sense. You know, you, you're, you're, you can't move like that with that kind of bone structure. It's kind of like when, you know, like it always kind of, it, it always kind of made me, uh, this is a true story. It always kind of made me go, huh? When Skeletor had eyes. Like even as a child, they just kind of bothered me. I know, and I'm, I'm like seven years old. I'm like, why does he have eyes though? Like that just doesn't make sense. So like everything kind of has to work, kind of. And I mean, you can kind of get the bend and you can have them stretch like 20% of their imagination, but you can't make them do like 50-50 with you. I think it's just, it's too much. So everything, you know, like this, um, even this, this fang here. No, this physiology, would it totally, totally work? I don't know, but it does, uh, it, it does kind of hit right. I think this is, and I'm not an anatomist. This is one of the few anatomy terms that I actually know is this thing right here. It's called a sternocleidomastoid, this thing that turns your head. It goes from here all the way down to the clavicle. This uh, kind of mounts there where the sterno, sterno would, I mean, the sterno would actually be a little bit further back. But I wanted to mount it at a place where I feel like there could be some musculature to where it could raise up and, and move, you know, as needed. So it's not all the way there. Like it's not, it's not all the way. Like if you skin, if I had to do an écorché of this thing, this makes no sense. But there is some anatomical truth to it. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm just asking the audience to stretch a little bit, not a lot though. So yeah, it works. You know, even like, okay, so these glands, because you know, like I guess in the black, in, in the black plagues or whatever plagues, you would, uh, one of the symptoms were swollen glands under the arms. So I was like, oh man, it'd be cool if you had some big, some nasty ass swollen glands under the arms. So I try to make it to where you look like they're kind of swollen and engorged with poison. And so they kind of push up the delt. I mean, if I ecorche that, would that make a lot of sense? It makes partial sense, but I feel like it makes enough sense to where the audience can go, okay, yeah, poison sacks under under his arms, you know, and you can even see like the weight happening here. And so even if it's not totally believable, at least make the physics of it, uh, uh, the physics of it believable. This form is pressing up against that one, lets me know that there's something in here, you know, it wraps around all the way underneath meets the form in the front. They all, it's all like this big junction. So the circulatory system for this particular gland can go back here and actually reach all of this. So it does kind of work, not all the way. So yes and no, but more, uh, more yes than no is better. Thank you, Quincy. Have you thought of selling post prints of your monsters or selling 3D files for people to print? Campbell Winslow is wondering. Yeah, I'm gonna do a, um, I think probably in like the next few months what I'm gonna start doing is, I'm gonna start selling base meshes, but it, what it'll be is it'll be like my monster base meshes. So <clears throat> it'll be something like this, or maybe not, this one is very specific. So, but yeah, I mean, you know, so what? But it might be something like this, and I'll sell the base mesh so that people can have their own, they can actually just use my proportions as a, as a starting point. Because one of the things that's really, really helpful is being able to go somewhere and buy a, a, uh, a human base mesh. So I'll buy them, and I'll completely sculpt over them, 100%. Uh, change the features, all that. But the landmarks are there. You know, it just makes it really easy. Like, okay, there's the nipple, there's the bottom of the rib cage, there's the waist, there's the clavicle. You know, and some of them will even have, you know, the skeleton inside of them. So you can actually make, you know, real true anatomical judgments. So I don't really see that 
with monsters. I see like a lot of monster brushes and stuff like that, but they're, it'll be like a, it'd be like a, a, a it'll be too specific. It'll be like a, a, a bird creature arm. But unless you're doing a bird, it doesn't, you know, it's not, it's not very conducive, you know, to, to, to whatever project you're working on. So I kind of wanted to do something um, with my base meshes and I will probably in about six months. So I'm going to start selling like monster base meshes. So I think I have about, I think I have about six so far that I'm going to sell. I think I have, I have several hands, um, teeth. So yeah, I'm, I'm slowly, I think I have about three or four more projects that I'm going to do. And then with that collection of base meshes, I'm going to compile them and sell them as a, as a small kit. Thank you, Quincy. It is 1.10. We've been at this webinar for an hour and 10 minutes. We're going to start wrapping up. Please send me any last uh, questions you may have for Quincy. As, as I ask Quincy a few questions of my own. Quincy, with back to school coming, with a lot of students heading back to the classroom or not this year, I would like uh, for you to send a, a message to self-learners like yourself, um, what a piece of advice you have for young art students or hobbyists trying to get into the 3D sculpting world? Um, one of the things I would say, I mean, there's a lot of things I could say that. Um, <clears throat> I would say that getting into 3D sculpting, is, it's an amazing medium to use. And, and I think it's definitely going to be the new sketch pad. I think forever. I think designing in 3D is never going to go away and it's only going to get stronger and better. Um, that being said, when you come into 3D, I think you should really kick back and really think about what it is that you really want to be doing in the 3D industry. Because, you know, for me, this is, <clears throat> this is what I want to do. And one of the reasons I don't work right now, um, other than having difficulty penetrating the industry with no experience, is that I didn't pursue this lifelong goal of, of creating monsters to get pigeonholed into making guns for Call of Duty. And shout out to whoever's making guns at guns Call of Duty, because it looks dope as hell. And, and, and I've never played Call of Duty, but my sister is severely addicted to it. Um, so is my nephew. Um, those are amazing games. They've done amazing things, but that's just not what I'm here for. So I would tell all students to really think about what it is that you really, really actually want to make. And when you enter the industry, you're going to have to understand that every, most people, 90% of the people are going to say, no, no, we need you to make this, you know? And I'm not saying don't pay your bills because that's something I would never say, <clears throat> but you have to understand, you have to keep a balance of doing what it is you love versus paying your bills. I mean, there are a lot of artists in the industry that have given up um, a lot of, and I wouldn't say a lot of artists, but I've met quite a few myself that have given up what they love to do in order to pay their bills. And they're curmudgeons, like they're not happy. They're trolls, to be honest with you. Their inner child is wounded. You know, that kid that used to stay up, like me, I was a kid in the basement watching Thriller, going, oh my God, those zombies are crazy. And now I'm making crazy ass monsters and my child is happy. Um, and there are people that have let the 3D industry mold them into asset creators. So if you are an asset creator, you're highly valued. You're gonna get, you're gonna get money, you're gonna get jobs, and you can have a great career and go on and create amazing assets. But if you're not an asset creator and you wanna be a 3D artist, you have to prepare for what that means to have to you know, swim upstream against an industry that is increasingly trying to, you know, make you create assets. So yeah, I definitely want you to follow your dreams, but I also want you to respect your finances too, but just recognize the choices that you're making in between those, in between those two, and make sure that the ratio is good enough for you so that your psyche, because this should be your, this is your sacred space drawing here. So when someone takes your sacred space away, you think about when you, when you found your own seat at lunch or whatever, when you're about to 
you're about to eat and you're like, oh, I'm going to have a moment of peace. And then somebody comes and sits right next to you. You're like, damn, dude, I sat all the way over here so that you would not come over here. It's your sacred space. So this is your sacred space. You should really be mindful of how many changes you allow in it, how many people you allow into that space. And a lot of people are going to try to penetrate that when you enter the 3D industry, depending on where you are, what you want to do, um, and what the industry needs are. So I I'm left some links for you guys of people who I think have really, really amazing resources for you to learn from. Learn those resources, talk to your inner child. Yeah, yeah, I'm breaking out my crystals and my pink headband with spirit questing. And just make sure that you and your, your, you know, your inner child, that, that child that first got interested in art is happy and make sure you're, you stay loyal to them at least to some degree. Work really hard, really understand what the program does and the limitations and, and you know, button commands. You know, um, definitely never stop learning because these programs update like two, three times a year. If you, let, if you don't pay attention for two years and you just got your head down, you don't even pay attention to the updates, you're gonna look up and you're gonna be surpassed by people who have been paying attention the whole time while you've had your head down you know, sculpting. So, um, but yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's an amazing medium and I can't think of any better way to create, you know, the things that I like to, to create. It's, it's a very worthwhile um, thing. Invest in your computers, invest in your equipment, like making your workspace ergonomic. You know, that's why I got this big ass 32. I love this 32 because you know what? I don't have shoulder problems because I get to actually move around when I, when I sculpt. And, you know, the smaller, like the tablets are great, but after a while on a little bitty tablet, everybody gets the same thing. You get a little ache right here in your shoulder. It's right here. Everybody gets it. It's right there. And it's from, you know, sitting in the same position. So when you can upgrade your workstation, get a better chair, get a better desk. Don't be cheap when it comes to references. Spend on your references. Don't go get a beer, go get a book. You know what I'm saying? Like, don't go take some meaningless trip. I mean, you can if you want to, if you have room enough to, to you know, replenish your well. So always, always, always invest in your materials. Always, because they're your weapons. Your computers, your computer equipment, always try to upgrade when you can. So I think that's, I think that's it. That's great advice, Quincy. Think about what you want to do. Never stop learning. Mm -hmm. your inner child great advice for those of us or of you going back to school this year mm -hmm. in whatever form that may be uh digitally or in the classroom we wish you well and quincy we we thank you so much for spending a beautiful afternoon with us today talking about monster making in your process we definitely want to bring you back doing monster fest because it's something really fun we're preparing later in october so stay tuned mm -hmm. and I think that's it. I think we're done for the day, Quincy. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you all. You guys have been really, really cool. And I appreciate everything you're doing with, uh, you know, giving me this platform and giving artists platforms that don't necessarily get all the light. I think that's really awesome. As a company, I think what you guys are doing is, is really cool and it's really important. I think you're setting a really good example and a good precedence for what other, uh, what other companies should also be doing because there are a lot of great artists that people I discover them all the time that no one's ever heard of and you know thank you for and I've discovered a lot of artists from the the welcome events that have been going on so thank you very much for for giving us a, a platform and a, and a voice we appreciate you thank you so much for saying that Quincy we love you we appreciate you and we appreciate everybody out there who spent this afternoon with us thank you so much thank you welcome for hosting thanks to my team for being here today we'll see you on Thursday on another welcome webinar session. It's a wrap and I'm going to leave um, the slide here so that you guys can remember um, the codes that we have available in North America. Thank you very much. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Thank you, bye. Bye everyone.